Hi, I'm Brian Levy. I'm a partner at Manchester Living and the host of the Manchester Living podcast. The purpose of the podcast is to help people navigate the complex maze of elder care. There is a lexicon of elder care terms on the website at manchesterlivingpodcast.com. Today's episode, we're talking about strategies for caregiver support and care. Uh, but first, let's go to new and noteworthy. Uh, my friend and world-renowned dementia expert, Tipa Snow, does a brief role play about caregiver fatigue. The main factor in avoiding caregiver fatigue is education and learning how to communicate with people with brain change. Let's go ahead and roll the clip. you to do is the classic caregiver, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, okay. <laughs> now I want you to grin and smile, Adam. Okay, now here's the new piece. All right, here's the new piece I'm gonna give you. Remember I said vision changes? What they lose is the edge, peripheral awareness, and their visual field gets smaller and smaller and smaller because they keep curiosity, which is your center field, and they lose the edge, which is safety awareness. So their visual field gets smaller and smaller. So by this point in the disease, at best, do this, put on binoculars. This is how much of the world they can pay attention to at a time. And when you're right in front of them like that, what part of you have you asked them to pay attention to? Your face. And so they're watching your face. So person with dementia, put on your binoculars. Person who's helping, grin and smile and say, okay, okay. <laughs> And now, make sure you've nodded and shake them up, and now reach out to their shirt. <laughs> what do you realize for the very first time? They can't see you coming. They were totally not expecting it. Try this. We're going to really work on these skills this afternoon, but I want you to try this. You put that on. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Oh. You do it. You got it? Mm hmm Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Education is so important in the elder care field, and I would encourage anyone to look at Tipa's YouTube channel. Um, let's jump in today. I'm excited to have my two guests, um, Dr. Jomshed and Kayla Clark. Um, let's, uh, let's just jump in. Kayla, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you and what do you do? Yes, yeah, so my name is Kayla Clark. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I am the uh, staff social worker for the UC Southwestern's House Call program. My role is to provide care coordination, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as um, just home-based care and assessments for our patients and their families. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. Dr. Jamshed. Well, thank you for having us. Um, so I have been doing geriatrics and home-based primary care um, since 2008. Um, I am now the medical director of our uh, UT Southwestern home-based primary care program. Um, moved here nine years ago from Washington, D.C. I'm also the program director of our uh, geriatric fellowship, so uh, do both educational and clinical component. Um, and uh, uh, do both um, home-based primary care, but also hospital um, care for older people in the past. Wonderful. I always like to have thought leaders and industry experts on the on the show. I think I nailed it this time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, let's start. Doctor, how does caregiving impact the physical and emotional well-being of caregivers, particularly when caring for older adults? Yeah, so, um, you know, unfortunately, we deal with this um, every day. I've been a caregiver myself, both for my mother-in-law who passed away in December and my father who was recently sick in January. And I think uh, sometimes we don't realize that as caregivers that uh, there are subtle physical and emotional changes that happen. Um, physically, um, there could be things like not being able to sleep um, and if sleeping, waking up. Um, uh, tiredness and fatigue. Um, and emotionally, the um, uh, feeling of uh, sadness, maybe even getting to the point of crying. And um, uh, if you're not able to sleep, then that in, in addition can put stress on. So I think the combination of both um, 
physical and emotional stress then sort of adds up together and uh, can present as caregiver burnout. Yeah, you wanna add to that? Absolutely. Um, I would definitely say the same. And often with our caregivers, um, what I've noticed is a lot of them are afraid to share how they're feeling and their experiences. A lot of the times I find myself helping them find the words to share because they're embarrassed and often just afraid to speak to how they're truly feeling. Sure. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. What are some common challenges care caregivers face when caring for older adults and how can how can they overcome those challenges? I think, um, you know, the um, biggest challenge we see is um, having difficulty um, navigating the healthcare system. Um, it's a very complex system and continues to work in silos. And, and it's very hard for caregivers sometimes to navigate. Um, in addition, as you pointed out earlier in the video, um, the lack of understanding and education um, and communication um, uh, it becomes a barrier as well. We as uh, clinicians take it for granted when somebody presents themselves as a caregiver that they understand and know everything. Um, we should never assume, um, and that is you know, our weakness. Um, and we, we need to be able to explain what's going on and what their understanding is of that. Also understanding the trajectory of what might happen. Um, I, I think oftentimes explaining to what to expect and what the trajectory might be and what may happen or, or what help they may need um, can improve those barriers. Great point. I, I um, like to use the analogy of driving. Yes. You know, when you're nine and you're at a friend's ranch and you can drive the golf cart around and yeah. that's cool. Mm -hmm. But when you're nine, you're not going to get on the LBJ and cruise up and down the highway. You don't know how to use turn signals. You don't know the laws. It's the same thing with caregiving. You have to educate yourself and know how to redirect, how to communicate with somebody with brain change. It's right. so important. And as Kayla pointed out, oftentimes caregivers are uh, uh, will shy away from asking questions. Um, there's feeling of guilt sometimes that you know we're why sh we shouldn't ask for help. And um, uh, it, again, if somebody's been a caregiver for a while, um, we tend to assume that they just know everything. Yeah. Um, for example, um, I'll give you my personal example. Uh, everyone assumed that as a fair physician who takes care of older people, I should just understand and know caregiving. It's very different when you yourself are the caregiver, regardless of how much expertise you may have. Yeah. The only thing that did help me was recognition. I, I was able to eventually recognize um, the caregiver um, uh, stress that I was feeling. Um, in fact, it was pointed out by my husband, who is not a geriatrician. <laughs> <laughs> but he plays one on TV. Yes. yes. Wonderful. Kayla, can you discuss the importance of self-care for caregivers and share some practical self-care strategies? Absolutely. Um, so the first thing I like to do when speaking with caregivers is to build rapport. Um, just to allow them to feel comfortable and to express themselves freely. A lot of caregivers tend to isolate themselves. They have little to no um, family or friends that they communicate with because their life is now centered around caring for their loved ones. And so one of the main things that I um, like to stress to them, number one is asking for help or utilizing their resources. And by resources, I mean a friend, um, a family member, just whoever's nearby, a neighbor, um, to assist with allowing them to have some time for themselves, whether it's for you to go sit at Chick-fil-A for an hour to have lunch by yourself, yeah. um, to take a shower and not have to worry about if mom or dad is going to fall, sure. things of that nature. Um, it's very important for them to um, center themselves sometimes so that they have the mental capacity to continue to provide the care that their loved one needs. Great points. A communication is so key. I tell my clients at Cambridge Caregivers, you have to communicate with the caregiver because they're not mind readers. Mm -hmm. And so when they walk in your home, it's a new environment for them. They don't okay. know your world. So unless you tell them and communicate with them, whatever it is, whether it's your nails are too long, your perfume's too strong, mom's very sensitive to loud noises, mm -hmm. all of those little tidbits of information can make or break an engagement and make or break the, the level of care that, that they're, uh, they're going to give. Yeah, and I think self-care is under um, 
underutilized and under-recognized. Um, if, if any of you are uh, moms or dads, um, I, I think you can relate to that, that we, if, if we don't take time out for ourselves, we may not be the best caregivers that we want to be. Um, but self-care is something that you have to decide for yourself. What kind of self-care works for you? For me, just going for a mani-pedi <laughs> is honestly, it's like a huge break, you know, um, and uh, it, it doesn't matter um, uh, what time of the day you do it. It's just respite and just uh, uh, re- booting or recharging. Um, some people like to um, run or hike. Some people like to exercise, but not everybody likes to exercise. Some people like to read or go out. And that's where respite care becomes very important. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's so important for people to take care of themselves because um, we don't um, sometimes recognize the subtle changes that happen over time if we don't do that and, and come out as unfortunately, caregiver burden, but also sometimes um, chronic conditions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. In addition to that, we um, we offer grief counseling to our caregivers. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, we, you, you really don't think about when there's a loss. You think about the family and all the people Absolutely. involved. That caregiver is just as close to the, 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 the client or the patient as their loved ones. And so we recognize and we have a right. professional grief counselor come in to work with our staff uh, because you know we don't just want them to go to one engagement to another engagement to another engagement and then it's just going to build up they have to take care of themselves yeah. and I think one of the things that we as uh, clinicians can do and uh, especially in home-based primary care it, it maybe it, it becomes more natural for us but when I know that there is a caregiver involved um, after I've talked to the patient I always ask the caregiver how are you doing and it's amazing um, how that simple question leads to different answers. And you know, some are doing okay, some are not, some need more help, and then I can connect them to Kayla yeah. if needed, or sometimes I am the one who's playing that role. Right, you know, we talked about this a little bit for, b before the show, but it's, in, it, it's interesting, the stops that we have in place at our agency mm -hmm. where caregivers have to take time off Mm -hmm. um, we do PTO for a reason and we make them take time off. That's self-care. We don't let caregivers work mm -hmm. through the night and then a new engagement the next morning. They have to get sleep. That's a great and idea. There's, um, there's stops in place to make sure when you're a, a family member as a caregiver, all bets are off. Yeah. There is no PTO. There's no vacation. It's, it's you. So um, I'm very, I always encourage family members mm -hmm. to take that personal time like you're talking about and don't let all the burden land on your, your, your own shoulders. So I have a, I have a patient um, who has a daughter as her caregiver. Um, the patient, uh, she's tried everything, but likes to stay up at night and sleep during the day. Um, her daughter doesn't work and uh, that's what she does. She sleeps when mom's sleeping and she's awake when mom's awake. And that works for her. Yeah. You know, she has created this system on her own of when uh, she needs to take the rest. And, um, you know, trying to fix um, her mother's um, uh, day and night is much more harder for her than just sleeping when mom sleeping. Some things you just can't fix, yes, right? Yes, you can't fix <laughs> exactly. everything. You can't. Um, how can caregivers navigate the healthcare system effectively to ensure their loved ones receive the best possible care? Kayla, do you want to? Sure. I personally think that starting with your primary care physician is a good step. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about our house calls program is that we have a social worker on staff that could assist with navigating through that system. Um, a lot of our patients are in need of caregivers and they may not meet certain criteria um, financially um, for those services. So we are sending them out to the state um, in different agencies to apply. Well, as many of us know, it's easy to kind of get lost in the shuffle when dealing with state services just because it's a tedious process. And sometimes our family members um, and caregivers get discouraged. That's where I come in at and help them navigate through the system. So I think the biggest 
thing that they can do is to ask questions and reach out um, whenever they're lost. I tell people all the time, no question is too big or too small for us. We have people that ask us um, about things such as where can they get meals? Um, where can they find someone to clip their toenails? A mobile dentist, whatever the case may be, even if it's a service that we cannot provide, we're usually able to at least point them in the right direction. Great, great. Doctor, you wanna add to that? Well, I'm, I'm going to be um, the devil's advocate here. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we do a good job as uh, clinicians, uh, especially physicians. You know, we lack information. Um, we uh, assume uh, too much. We uh, sometimes don't explain things. So I think that uh, one of the things I love about being a geriatrician is that um, and working in a team and in an interdisciplinary team is that I, I learned from Kayla. So if I'm in somebody's home and um, you know Kayla is not immediately available, I can at least give them some information or I can understand what they're saying or where they're coming from. So I, I think that um, I, I wish we did a better job of teaching our own primary care physicians um, on how to navigate the healthcare system. Mm-hmm. Um, the bigger the system, the more difficult it is. Right. Um, but our biggest need um, has been um, what Kayla has pointed out is trying to figure out resources as simple as you know meals but mm-hmm. also finding caregivers and uh, finding programs and um, um, uh, one of the uh, programs that can support both the patient and the caregiver sometimes we've had to call um, well the other day um, I went um, to see a, a couple uh, an older couple who live by themselves in a home and I walked in and I smelled gas. Mm-hmm. And I was worried. Um, there, we have a protocol and process of what needs to be done. Um, I went out, um, called the gas company. Um, uh, they sent somebody out and uh, there was an issue. Um, and that led to them changing the pipelines and everything. But um, had somebody not gone in, uh, you know, they were already experiencing some uh, side effects. Yeah. Um, I think that's the other thing um, in navigating the system. If we recognize somebody is living by themselves and doesn't have a lot of support, we need to figure out how we can have eyes on them. We can utilize social workers. We can utilize home health agencies. Um, Sometimes we just ask our nurse to make a phone call and they are wonderful. Uh, Our nurse, uh, Teresa Dupree, is great at being able to get that information on the phone. Yeah, that's great. Like I said, when we were kids and they said, knowledge is power, knowledge -hmm. knowledge is power. And educating yourself on whatever resources are available Mm -hmm. is so important. Thank you. How can caregivers advocate for their loved one's needs within the healthcare setting and beyond. Kayla? Sure. I would say they um, the best thing that they can do is just um, identify what the needs are and try to um, best explain them to the care provider um, and also continue to just put emphasis on it. So oftentimes um, caregivers and patients sometimes will minimize what they're feeling. And I think just being honest about, you know, the intensity of it can definitely be helpful. Great. What role can technology play in supporting caregivers and enhancing their caregiver experience? I know there's all sorts of tools and phones and iPhone. You love technology, phones, um, FaceTime, the the Amazon tools and all that. You know, so the one good thing that came out of COVID Uh was that we started using technology, FaceTime, Doximity. Um, I will tell you that the older generation in their 90s struggled a lot with that technology. But if they had a caregiver to help them, it was a completely different uh, situation sure. where we could actually communicate better. Uh, some of the technologies that some of our patients have used are we have reminders uh, mm-hmm. for medication, mm-hmm. uh, automatic. We have uh, medication dispensers that just dispense at that time. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, the safety alert that you can press. Um, there are games that some of our patients, um, there's also some studies going on trying to utilize technology for fall prevention and training and things like that. The iWatch. Um, so the iWatch itself, I can tell you I was running and I fell <laughs> and um, it sent out an um, a SOS. Did it really? And um, my dog was just staring at me. <laughs> I was, Moral of the story, don't I run. I was embarrassed. <laughs> and you know, falls are a big concern in older people yeah. and caregivers have to often deal with that. So. 
having technology to help with that, um, I'm very excited about um, things like chat GPT um, to be evolving. And I think our newer generation, especially our generation who's getting used to it and the younger generation as they get older, will be utilizing this a lot more. And we have to, we have to start getting familiar with it and being comfortable with it. I think there's still a level of discomfort with technology. Sure. Um, but people are very good about uh, technology like um, checking their blood pressure and blood sugars at home and the doctor receiving that information. So, um, you know, it's a great start, but we have a long way to go. Sure, thank you. Uh, how can healthcare professionals better support and educate caregivers to empower them in their caregiving role? Yeah, I think the first thing uh, healthcare professionals can do is recognize how important the role of the caregiver is and recognize them as advocates. So just what Kayla was saying, I think that sometimes we think, oh, well, you know, they're giving us too much information or maybe they don't understand things. That's not the fact. The caregiver knows the person that they're taking care of the best. And healthcare professionals need to recognize that. We need to recognize caregiver burden. We have to recognize caregiver stress. And I think geriatricians by nature do a good job of it, um, but not everybody, not in the healthcare world, I don't think we do a good job of teaching all uh, our healthcare professionals about it. So um, I, I, I think that recognizing that role as being important and supporting them and understanding them as a team is what's important. And you know, I'll be honest, there are times that we walk into a home and um, we have caregivers who may not be um, doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and uh, in some ways there may be harm as well, but we have to tread very carefully with such situations. Even in those situations, we first need to recognize why it's happening and not jump to conclusions. And so at least in our home-based primary care program, we make every effort to make sure that there's support for the caregiver, we understand the situation before we take any drastic measures. Um, so. Great, thank you. All right, Kayla, what haven't I asked you that I should? I think the most important thing um, for our viewers to know or to understand is the importance of giving caregivers a chance. Um, oftentimes when I'm referring families out to an agency for a caregiver, I often like to let them know that the first caregiver may not be a good fit, and that's okay. Um, if this is someone that's going to essentially spend a lot of time with your loved one, so it's almost kind of like matchmaking. You have to figure out exactly, you know, what their needs are, what their interests are. And the first one or two may not fit, but just to not lose faith or hope and just keep trying and you will find someone that is a good fit for you and it's life changing. You hit the nail right on the head. It's a matchmaking mm -hmm. game and it doesn't always work. It the doesn't. first date's not always the best date. <laughs> yeah. Give it time. Absolutely. I had a, a, a client who called me and said, this caregiver's so stupid. She went to the wrong house, rang the wrong doorbell, oh. da -da -da, I mean, went on and on and on. And I said, Please Please just give it a chance, mm -hmm. give it a chance. The next day she called me and says, I'm so sorry, can she live in? <laughs> she wanted to keep her 24 seven. So yeah. give it time. Yeah. Doctor, what haven't I asked you that I should? Um, I think one of the things caregivers struggle with is how to communicate or manage people with cognitive impairment. And depending on the degree of cognitive impairment, it can be difficult. Um, there are, um, I do tell caregivers not to be confrontational um, uh, because it's, it's very hard, especially if the caregiver is a family member, for them to see their loved one um, and that person in, um, in this new state, which may be their baseline now. So you, you have to recognize that it's not easy. I think that's where our role comes in, um, that um, non-confrontational, simple questions with choices, not what would you like to eat? but rather would you like to have eggs or pancake? Right. So very simple, make sure you're communicating with the person. And even if I have a patient who has advanced dementia and they are in bed and they can't understand what I'm saying, I'm always looking at them and talking um, to them. And then I say, I'm now gonna talk to your caregiver 
And then I'm still talking to the patient and letting the caregiver know that I'm asking you the questions. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we mu we've sometimes uh, don't realize that it doesn't matter if someone has cognitive impairment or not. Uh, what if somewhere a chapter opens up and, um, and they feel ignored? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I, it, cognitive impairment and communicating and taking care of someone with that, um, whether it's mild or advanced, um, is challenging for caregivers sure. and, and we need to do a good job or a better job yeah. of, of uh, preparing them for it. Our director of nursing has a saying, she always tells, tells all of us, meet them where they are. Yes. And I think yes. that starts with education yes. so you can understand where they are. Right. And then go from there. And so. there is, uh, I read um, in one of the neurobehavior books that uh, music is something that tends to stay um, with people even with severe cognitive impairment. So playing music that you may know that they used to like um, uh, is helpful. One of the things that I find difficult is when I go to a facility and the television is on and nobody is watching or if somebody is watching it's just background noise or those those can be very difficult for it's, patients it's with noise. cognitive impairment it's it is noise. noise and it's not music yeah you know so if you are going to have noise make it a pleasant noise beautiful i love it what a great note to end on thank you for sharing <laughs> you. that all right let's yeah. move on to the nugget portion of this episode we'll put up the visual new caregiver realizes assisted living isn't about watching Wheel of Fortune and doing some dishes. <laughs> wow. That's a great That's so visual, cute. but it's true. It's like Adorable. live live a day in the life of a caregiver yeah, and you yes. realize there's more to it than there's... music therapy and painting, Absolutely. right? Yes. It's a it's a tough job. Yes, so it is. all right, we're gonna roll into the uh, lightning round of this oh, episode. Yeah. This is an opportunity for viewers to get to know both of you okay. on a personal basis. Quick answers. I'm gonna start with Kayla and then yeah. we'll round robin. Kayla, where were you born and raised? Shreveport, Louisiana. Oh. Pakistan. Welcome. College and degree. Northwestern State University, Bachelor in Social Work, and Stephen F. Austin State University, Master in Social Work. Wow. I went to the Aga Khan University in Pakistan and then did my fellowship training at UCLA. Um, yeah. What instrument do you play? None. None. <laughs> no None. instrument, not musical. Do you stay in touch with childhood friends? Yes, absolutely. Do absolutely. You? I love that. Spicy food or plain Jane? Spicy. Spicy. Okay. <laughs> Call or text? Call. Text. <laughs> <laughs> Ever broken a bone? No. Yes. Okay. Favorite ice cream flavor? Vanilla. Chocolate. Okay. Can you change a tire? Yes. Yes. Hmm. No. Um, <laughs> iPhone or Android? iPhone. iPhone. There you go. Are you sentimental? A little. No. Wow. Karaoke, yes or no? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Favorite band? Nickelback. Don't have one. Okay. Ever lived abroad? I have not. Yes. Obviously. I lived in Singapore. Oh, oh wow. Cool. Cool. Getting to know you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you guys for being here. Thank this you has so been much. so informative. Thank you so much I, for having us. Yeah, this is great. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise. If um, if you want to see this episode or any past episodes, you can log on to Manchester Living Podcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts or social media, YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, iTunes, wherever. Um, you can look at this episode or past episodes. Also, if you are interested in learning more or getting in touch with these two experts, uh, we'll put up a URL um, before the credits roll. So thanks for watching today. If there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to call me directly. <laughs>